Still know 
rejoice in your presence this day. This is the day that you have made. I choose to be glad and to rejoice in it. Father, I know that in your word are the depths of truth, are the direction for my feet, my hands, for my life. I thank you today for revelation knowledge, for a word of encouragement, for a word of joy, for a word of strength, for a word of revelation. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 It's interesting. I believe it's been said by so many people right now in this time, what crazy times. <laughs> Look at what's going on. The reality is, is most everybody is aware of things happening in this natural realm. In essence, the whole world is taking a breath and watching and looking and seeing I personally have seen many different reactions and responses from people. There's a difference. Today, I want to speak to the body of believers. It's interesting as I say that. I'm sitting, standing in a church that is filled with just a few of us, but is totally filled with the Spirit of God. We are recording this service so that we can impart God's word to you because of what is going on around all the things that I described. They do not allow us to be able to sit together in unity. I want to assure you, I'm not discouraged. <laughs> there are times where people have had, 2,020 years ago, people had physical contact and shared the same space with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. But Jesus said to them, it's advantageous for you that I go to the Father. I believe there was people that were troubled with that because they saw all the great and mighty things that Jesus did. They may have associated that his physical presence was the thing that manifested those signs and wonders and everything that, that they had been so blessed to be able to see with their eyes, but Jesus said, it's advantageous for you because when I go to the Father, I'm going to send another, the Holy Spirit. He will reside in you. So as believers, knowing that there's a God, accepting his Son, as it says in Romans 10, believing in your heart that this God sent his Son for us, confessing with our mouth that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, Heaven now resides in us. The Holy Spirit now resides in us. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And there are things happening right now in this world that many of us are wondering, what do I do? 
The world's message is meet your own needs, meet your own protection needs, meet your own food needs, meet your own toilet paper needs. There are so many things out there, and the world's message is do it the world's way, meet your own needs, but you serve a God that wants you to seek him out so that he can show you how to move, how to operate, and how to listen so that you can move and operate by hearing the voice in this natural realm. So the message I have for you It's not my message. It's God's message. I'm just the vessel to be able to deliver that. And it's quite simple. It's really a question, and then within this word, you'll have the answer. And I think the big question is, what do I do? Things are changing literally hour to hour with this virus that is going around that people are all aware of. It's changing just normal, everyday functions that we have, whether our work, our relationships with people. Again, I'm looking at, looking at a bunch of empty chairs in the natural, but I see your faces in the spiritual. Normally, I would say at the beginning of service, let's give somebody some sugar. What I mean by that is a physical hug. Right now, know that I'm giving you some spiritual sugar. No that you should not be frustrated because you may not be able to reach out and touch somebody in the pew. Rejoice spiritually, and God will give you direction of what to do. Again, what do I do in times like this? What do I do in times like this? So if you're a believer, what I'm going to share with you is spiritual word. Mary, the mother of Jesus, she gives some of the best, best direction in all of scripture. In John 2, 5, she simply says to the people that were around her, and this includes us, whatever he says to you, do it. What is God saying to you right now? What is Jesus saying to you right now? What is the Holy Spirit saying to you right now? The answer to that question is very important to give you a opportunity to define where you are at right now. Some of you may know, hey, the Lord has guided me and told me to do this, and that's wonderful. But there may be many more that go, I know the Lord has some direction, but I just don't hear it. I don't see it. And amidst everything that is going on, it's hard for me to hear his voice with all this stuff going on. We're, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about my paycheck. I'm concerned about not, not seeing my family who lives in different houses and I'm supposed to, you know, be operating in social distancing. So, so I know God has something, but I just don't know if I hear him. What do I do? I got good news for you. Do what Jesus tells you to do and I'm gonna share with you what that looks like. Of course, with scripture, how many of you know that Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. You're the sheep. He said, the sheep know my voice. Well, sometimes it's like, I just got this image in my head. You know, if you've ever been in a gymnasium watching sports and, you know, there's kids playing, there's cheerleaders cheering, and there's people on the bench and, you know, yelling and screaming for their teammates and there's parents and family members up in the bleachers and yelling and screaming and there you are and you hear all this reverberation of, of, of voice and things that are happening out there and it's, it's like, ah, I can't hear myself think, right? So how do you hear the voice of God with all of that chaos that's going there? Jesus knew this would happen in many areas of our life, and so he gave us a word for that. I want to share with you in the book of John, the book of John, Jesus explains exactly what you should do. Sit down. Sit down. What? There's too much going on. I mean, I got I to gotta go to the store. I got to, you know, I got, got things to do. Jesus said, sit down. I'll share John chapter 6, verse 10. And Jesus said, make the people sit down. 
Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed. And the disciples distributed that to the people that were sitting down. And likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to the disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. There's a few key things that we should listen to within these few verses. First, whatever Jesus said, his mother mentioned to the people around him, do it. So whatever he says, do it. Jesus is telling you to sit down. Another important thing to gather out of this, those of you that are familiar with these scriptures of what was going on, many thousands of people followed him out into a place where there wasn't normal provision. What do I mean by that? See, in town where they lived, if they needed to go to the marketplace and get food, how many of you like to eat? <laughs> to get food, they could just go to their marketplace or wherever the food store source was and get food. And then they would go to their house and they would sit down, they would prepare the food and then they would eat. This is what people do. But in this particular location, there was none of that around. None of it. And so there came a time at the end of Jesus ministering to these thousands and thousands of people that they were hungry and they were so far away from their town that they couldn't just go and eat, but Jesus knew that they needed something. He wanted to meet their need. In order to do that, he had to first get them positioned before the supply came. Sit down. Spend time this is the first thing you should do. Spend time feeding on God's word. Now, some of you may be going, gosh, that voice is so loud. There's so many things going on. And with this coronavirus, I want to share with you that you should be aware of what's going on because things are changing. In fact, there are things in, in direction coming from our government that affect every single one of us that we should abide by. I want to share quickly what I mean by that. 1 Timothy 1, 2 says, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications and prayers and intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority. Our government and people that have been placed there are an authority that we have to respond to in this natural realm. Now, don't get mad at me and write me emails because I'm not, I'm not getting political on you. I'm just sharing what God's word says. It also says in Romans 13, 1, everyone must submit to governing authorities for all authority comes from God. And those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So now things are changing dynamically by these authorities. Whether you agree with them or not, God in his word said that we must submit to those authorities. Now, the word also says submit to God. The Bible says that God is spirit, that God is love. How do you submit to spirit and then to these authorities? This is where I believe a lot of this question, this question bids, what do I do in times like this? This is, it's in between those. What are some tangible things to do? And as a believer, the first thing that you need to do, again, is sit down and stay abreast of what's going on in the natural realm, but don't meditate on the details. What do I mean by that? I got caught up in it this morning. It was very interesting. I knew that daily that the president is, is giving announcements and updates of what's going on. And as I was submitting myself to the Holy Spirit, I should say an attempt to, I couldn't help but wonder what's going on out there. Is there like an update that I need to know? So I'm like, I multitask, just being transparent. So I started a worship song, and then I'm like, kind of had YouTube going, and I saw this 
live feed from the president. I'm like, oh, spiritual worship song, live feed, submit to the authorities. Well, Lord, you said to submit to the authorities in Romans 13, 1, so I'll just put away the worship a little bit, and I'll get over here. And, and so I started to listen to that, and then I found myself several minutes later, I heard a couple of facts, and that was great, and then I started looking at some other stuff, and they were just kind of regurgitating those facts in slightly different words, and then as you listen more, there's a little bit more regurgitation of this fact, and so how do you know when you've, you're paying attention to the details? You're actually hearing the same thing over and over, but a different voice and a different face saying it. Stop. Know the headlines of what you're supposed to do, but don't meditate on them. And I found myself this very morning, a pastor leading the flock, getting caught up in this. And the Holy Spirit began to minister to me as I've been meditating on this. I just needed to sit down. So stay alert to what's going on, but that should be the second thing, and you shouldn't be meditating. See, whatever you meditate on or focus on or feed on is gonna become more dominant. And as believers, we're supposed to be trusting God. But we get caught up in all this stuff, and it's very easy to see things in the natural realm going on that everybody is talking about. You may be built up in faith, and all you have to do is go to the store, and there's somebody going to be beside you freaking out, you know, cursing out people for hoarding too much stuff. Or, or did you hear this? I heard that. Did you hear what was going on over here? Well, I heard there's going to be this, and I heard there's going to be that. There's a mandatory this. And, and, and you may have been in a position of peace, but immediately you're going to start getting drawn in by all this stuff. That's going to happen. You cannot avoid that. What the Lord wants you to do is in this position of sitting down and focusing on him, you're going to be filled up enough to be able to spit out the bones, if you will, as you go around in the world and hear a lot of these things that are going on. So spend time feeding on God's word. Feed on his faithfulness. The Bible says, as we shared in John 6.10, that Jesus said, sit down. I, wanna, I want to kind of draw out a little revelation of what that means. When I say sit down, I can see a few people in front of me, less than 10, just for you folks out there, um, they're sitting down. So, you know, your backside goes down. Your knees get to a 90-degree angle. Are you saying this, Pastor, just sit down? Now what? The word sit down, the Greek defines it like this. It literally means to lie back or recline. Jesus said to all those people that had a need, and he wanted to f meet those needs. If you go back in, in John, you're going to see that they had eaten, and verse 12 in John 6 says, so when they were filled, when they were filled, meaning God didn't leave them just with a little snack. He wants you to be completely filled. But in order to get filled with the supply, you must be in a position to receive the supply. It means to lie back, recline. Yep, this is what I'm sharing with you. You need to rest in the Lord. Position comes before provision. And the, prov the position is nothing more than rest. God cannot provide for people that are running around stressed out. He can't. I'll give you an example of that. Mary and Martha, we have probably have read in Luke 10 about Mary and Martha. I'll share this scripture, verse 38 through 41 of Luke chapter 10. And it says, now it happened as they went, he entered a certain village. Of course, this is speaking of Jesus. And a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. How many of you wouldn't do that? Jesus, you're my Lord. Come into my house. Now watch what happens here. She invited him in. She knew who Jesus was. He's the good shepherd. He's doing all these things. He comes to town. You're like, come to my house. And she, and she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, 
Do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. What was the good part? She sat down at the feet of Jesus. So imagine Martha, who had good intentions, invites the Lord into her house. She's in the very present and proximity of Jesus himself, and yet she's distracted. So this is what happens with a lot of people and all these distractions that are going on. You're a believer. God is in your heart. The Holy Spirit is there to guide and counsel you. But you're so distracted by all these other things that you can't hear the good word that's happening. So... A separation is necessary, meaning you need to be able to sit down and rest in God's presence. See, after you sit down, you will then receive the supply. When you sit down and rest and get back in God's presence, you're going to receive the supply. What is the supply you need? It could be toilet paper. It could be other things. Just a short factual testimony, my wife and I, these last few weeks, um, we had plenty of toilet paper. Uh, however, we were, we were pretty low. And about the time I started hearing that people were looking for toilet paper, my, my mind kind of, why are people looking for toilet paper? You know, and, and this, was just, this was just weeks ago. And I'm like, so then I go out in the garage and I look and I'm like, eh, we got some, but well, maybe we need more. So I says to my wife, wife maybe we need more so we go to the local costco and i know i'm alone in this i'm probably the only one that that you you grab your card you show your card and you beeline here at our local costco you know you enter in the door and it's the far left corner of the store and we're just you know looking at all the other stuff no samples of food you go right to and as we start approaching and come around the corner all of a sudden the bays that are normally filled empty and we get closer and empty and all of a sudden there's not what we were looking for and we had a supply at home but now all of a sudden we wanted it more because it's not there and then we went to a couple other stores it's not there then we started talking to people do you got enough do you got enough toilet paper i mean what 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 and i'm like what happened to me (laughs) pastor isn't the lord my provider and The word says that if the father provides for the birds of the air, how much more would he provide for me and my nose and my backside if I need? Why, he would provide some stuff, wouldn't he? But this was kept going. So finally, I was just like, you know what, Lord? We'll get toilet paper when we need. And praise the Lord, we got some rolls right now. And I purposed in my heart that I wasn't going to stress and worry about it. This was weeks ago. Yesterday was the first day that we got toilet paper. You know what happened? We just went to another little store and to buy a birthday card. And in the process of the looking for a birthday card, we're like, hey, let's go see if they got any TP. They did. We didn't run out all these weeks. My point is, I heard from the Lord, relax, I'll take care of you and your backside. That's how good God is. He wants your supply to be filled. We don't need more than what we had, so God provided. So when you sit down and get in God's presence, then the supply will come. Notice in John 6, 3, that it also said, they rested in much grass. Jesus said, make the people sit down, and then the scripture says, there was much grass. It gave a description of what was going on. It sounds a lot like Psalm 23. Jesus was just operating according to what the psalm said. Psalm 23, verses 1 through 3, many of you know this, and it says, the Lord is my shepherd. Is he? I'm the good shepherd, Jesus said. The sheep know my voice. Do you? The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. 
What do I do in this path of life? The good shepherd will lead you. And in Psalm 23, it says exactly what it says in John 6. The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down. You need to recline, sit back, rest in the Lord first before you go out into this sometimes described as chaotic life that's going on right now. Don't panic. So in his presence, there's great abundance. You don't have to be running around crazy seeking every bit of toilet paper in your life. So what is your part? Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. So what is that? There are things that you need right now. Maybe it's food, maybe it's, it's income because there's a lot, again, described as what's going on. Maybe you need finances, you need, he- you need healing, you need all this, this stuff. But Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. What does that mean? The kingdom, it's actually the word kingdom comes from the Greek word basileia. And it doesn't describe a a realm of a place, but rather the right or authority to rule within a realm. So we're in this natural realm, but we, we, the scripture says we're in the world, but not of the world, right? That that we are, the scripture actually says that we're aliens to this part. We're, I mean, we're, we're spiritual creatures. We live in a body and we have a soul, the will, the mind, and the emotion, they all are, are interconnected, but we should be led with our, with our spirit first. So when you're seeking the things of God, that means you're putting aside to not worry about where they're going to come from, but seek God and how to rule or reign in this authority in, or with your authority within this realm. Seek God, and then all the things that you were being tempted to worry about will be added to you. Do not worry. When you look up do not worry in scripture, oh, the scripture is packed. All you have to do is get on a, uh, a scripture search engine and just put in worry not or do not worry or fear not. And look how many places. It's a commandment from our Lord. Did you know worry is sin? Why just worry about this? I hear people on the news all the time. Well, the fear is, look. Their message is worry and fear. It doesn't deny that there are things going on. You're supposed to move in faith. What is faith? It's the substance of things hoped for, but the evidence of things not seen. When I looked in my garage, the substance of what I had, toilet paper, was pretty lean. But what I was hoping for was toilet paper. I got in God's presence. He said, don't worry, I'll supply. Weeks went by, and we got it, and we never ran out. Didn't even get close to running out. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That's Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So verse one, literally three words in, he, that's you and I, who dwells, the third word, dwells. Hebrew word, yashav. You know what it means? Break it down in Hebrew. Sit down. (laughs) That's literally what it means. Sit down. He who sits down in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That is so good. Why are people struggling with it? Because you're sitting in the presence of the details of the world You're focusing on that more. You should be learned about what's going on, but don't get so caught up in the details that it completely rules every single aspect of your thought life. God wants your soul to be restored. He goes on to say in verse two, the word Psalm 91, and I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God in him I will trust. Did you see that there's a confession in there? So you need to sit back and then confess. God is the one that is my refuge, my fortress. In him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. Do you know what that word pestilence breaks down to in the Hebrew? Plague. 
He will deliver us. But people are out there worried. Oh, I got to make sure that I get my stuff. And, you know, and man, I, I fear that this thing will come on me. It's interesting. Job said that. My greatest fears have come upon me. I'll give you a quick little lesson about that. Sometimes people go, well, God, he, 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 you know, he said to the devil, go, you know, you have access to my servant Job. I want to share something with you about how God is. God always wants to protect you. And when you study that scripture out, you're going to find a man in Job who loved God, but he had a lot of fear in his life. God had a bubble of protection around him. The devil came up to heaven and, and spoke, and God says, what are you up to? He says, just roaming about the earth, looking to and fro. What is he looking for? He's looking for somebody that he has, he has access to. How does, how does he know he has access to him? If the devil's walking by, he's listening for people that are speaking fear-based words. He's going, that's the door that I can get in. Why? Because they don't have faith. They have fear, and that's going to give me access into their life. But every time he went around Job, there was a, there was a hedge of protection around him. Oh, God's got him. I'm not even going to... I'm not even, I can't even, I, I, I can't even see into him. But I want you to imagine Job within this bubble, even though he was protected by God, he had fear in his life. And so God says to, to, to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Nope, there's a hedge about him. But I tell you what, if you didn't have it, if he didn't have that on there, so what did God do? He lifted off the hedge of protection because he knew Job's heart. But when he lifted off the hedge of protection off of Job, what Job had was now exposed, and that was fear. So now the devil had access, and Job said, my greatest fear had come upon me. Study it out. Job was giving up offerings because he feared that things would happen to his family. And what happened? Things happened to his family. So fear, it is not something we should be doing. When you, when you read the psalm, you're saying, he's my refuge, he's my strength. That doesn't mean you're denying some fearful thoughts and things that are going on, but don't give in to them. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield. What is the truth? Stores are out of things. Stuff is changing. But what is God's truth? You're going to be okay. You're more than a conqueror. That faith will lead you to victory. That God's going to provide for you. All you have to do is sit down and get in his presence and listen for the direction. And many of you, I pray, are doing that. But I know there are many of you that are not. And this is the answer. What do I do? Just sit back and get in God's presence. Listen for what he's saying. You're like, I need toilet paper. Are you trying to provide your own need or ask the Lord? Lord, how am I doing? He said, well, go out in the garage. Look at those, you know, four cases that you have out there. Do you need it today? Well, what happens if I need it tomorrow or in five months from now? We don't never know what's going to happen. He said, hey, tomorrow's going to have trouble of its own. Today, <laughs> I've provided for you. Get your peace. Get your peace back. Don't move in fear. I want to move on to verse 9 here in Psalm 91. It says, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling, that means your home habitation, that, you're, that he's around you, your dwelling place. It says, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. I don't know about you, but I believe the coronavirus falls within that description. And then it says in verse 11, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Hmm. So it's not about just running around and quoting scriptures and trusting God and he's got a plan. The provision comes based on you positioning yourself first. It's about relationship. I've seen a lot of really good things. Yeah, as I look out in these seats, I'm like, well, I wish I could come down and just give some people some sugar, but I love you from a distance. But I've seen some great things as I've been walking around my yard and doing some spring cleaning. I've noticed people walking with their kids that they probably wouldn't have normally done at that time of day. I've noticed people walking hand in hand, smiling, just taking things in, riding bikes together, getting outside together, doing things and fellowshipping. There is value for everybody to kind of take a breath. 
Because there are some people that in the normal schedule, they work too hard. They call them people that are workaholics. And now some of these fathers are spending time with their children that they didn't before. Don't get tempted to be stressed out. Embrace the moment because God is going to provide for you. And expect good from him. Why? Because scripture says in God there's nothing but good. God is good all the time. He is faithful all the time. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. The scripture says in Ephesians 6, Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, you just stand in the presence of God in the evil day. Notice what it says. That's singular. Because when you start studying God's word, you're going to see in 1 Peter 3, it says, He who would love life and see good days. If you love life, you're going to see good days. That's plural. This too shall pass. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's good. He's got a plan. Getting in rest, sitting back, the plan will be delivered. <clears throat> it's not being busy and watching things unfold and go, well, this must be God's plan. I assure you that he will reveal to you when you just spend some time, get away from the distractions, and hear the voice of the Good Shepherd. Purpose in your heart to sow a smile today. Wave at somebody. Maybe you're more restricted in your movements, but look at what you have. Philippians 4, 8 talks about whatever things are good, whatever things are virtuous, if there's any praise in anything, if, if meditate on these things. Whatever is a good report, this is why it's so important not to get so caught up in all the news. Listen to the headline, but don't get caught up in all the details because they're not such good reports. And it will fill you with fear, but getting in God's presence will fill you with faith. And right now it's so important to... Get your spirit filled because we still do have to operate in the natural realm. Thank you, Lord. For all of you watching, I want to give an opportunity. If you don't know God and you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity. It's so easy to do. If you're hurting, if you're having needs and you just don't know what to do, God can reveal that to you. It's very simple. Just bow your head right now and just confess after me. Father God, I know that you're real. By faith today, I believe that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for me, for the remissions of my sins, to get me on the right track. Today, Lord, I receive Jesus into my heart. Jesus, I make you my Lord. Do something with my life. I receive you now by faith. Amen. It's that simple to come to God by faith. Don't listen to the thoughts that say, well, how can I believe in somebody that I don't see or somebody that I don't know? I assure you that God sees you and God knows you. He's seen every day of your life. He believes in you. If you've been a little off pace, you are a Christian and you were like me this morning, got caught up in the things and you just want to get back on track, it's quite simple. Just get in a position of rest and peace and pray this prayer. Father God, like the prodigal son who went out and joined with the citizen of the world, he squandered what he had and straight away from you and Father I have it in my thoughts and some of my actions but like the prodigal son 
he came to his senses. Today I come to my senses and I look back to you. I return to you, Father. I thank you that you receive me. And when I come into your house, that there will be provision. I rejoice in that. I recommit to you, Lord, right now. It's that simple. And finally, I thank God that we have helps ministers and equipment to be able to bring you this message. I thank God as we used our faith, he's provided some of these things. If you were fed spiritually today, according to God's word, and you want to give God glory and worship him in tithes and offerings as your light of the Lord, scripture says God loves a cheerful giver. Read Malachi 3, chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. I'll just headline that for you. God says to the people who knew him, you're cursed with the curse. You have robbed me. The people say, God, how have we robbed you? And he said, in tithes and offerings, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me now in this and see if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing for you that you have room enough not to receive. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake and he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground. I want to explain that scripture to you real quick. God didn't curse the people. These were people that knew God and were probably operating in their lives like many of us do. You know, we give here and there, we do stuff, we trust God. But man, why is my life so... It's not a product of what I think it should be. That's why God was saying, he was actually saying what he was seeing in their life. You're, 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 you're cursed. You're, you're not, you don't have the blessing. You don't have an increase. You don't have peace. He said, you're, you're cursed with the curse. And I'm going to tell you why. Because you've robbed from me. I know it's a strong word, but he's just saying, I'm showing you the process. That when you sow into my garden, this can produce my fruit. When you sow into the world's garden, this can produce its fruit. So he said, just bring it to me, and I'll increase you. And not only that, I'll put a hedge of protection around you. So where you're at, lay your hand on your seat. That might be a debit card. You know, we're doing things electronically right now. There'll be a place to donate. You'll see it on the, on the screen or on our website. But on your seat, we pray and believe with you. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we are sowing good seed into your ground. We praise you and give you glory. We thank you, Father, that all, ooh, thank you. Lord. There are people out there that are thinking right now, I need, to, I need to guard what it is that I have now. But if you needed fruit, you would plant a seed. So if you want what God wants to produce and promises, then this is the time to sow a seed, and God will provide. It's that simple. Father, we praise you and thank you for this revelation. I know that... I know that you see those that have a heart to worship you in this area. We thank you for the partners and for the saints and of this ministry. We pray into their lives as they sow seed, Father, that you shall put a hedge of protection over them and meet the devourer for their sake, and you, that he will not destroy the fruit of their ground. That fruit is their children, their jobs, their homes. We praise you and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now you know what to do. Sit back. Get in God's presence. He will show you what to do with your hands and your feet and your mind. And then move according to what he says. Be blessed. And I love you.